My name's Eric Elliott. I am the archivist here at the Moravian Archives in Winston-Salem, Moravian Archives, Southern Province. I wanted to share with you today an update on a project uh, that has consumed uh, uh, a lot of our volunteer time and uh, we'll continue to do that for the next several months. Um, but just tell you about its origins and what we hope for it to do. And I'm so glad to see so many from Old Salem here because uh, uh, this should be a collaborative enterprise. I have learned so much from you all. Um, I hope to make our materials more available and accessible for you all to learn what we've got. But there's challenges to that in this topic, as you probably already know. So we'll just go over a few things for you today. Um, you know, our place uh, uh, probably has more visitors coming to us to talk about genealogy than any other subject matter. Probably half or more of our guests that walk through the door want to know about their family history. And Moravians got these great records about um, Moravians. Uh, their church, uh, every church had to have a diary, you've got the memoranda, you've got the, uh, all sorts of things. We, we have to come into our reading room and we've got these categories of things to look at. We've got memoirs, historical maps, graveyards, the church diaries, military service records, uh, the church publications, individual family genealogies. You get to the memoirs, we've got 14,485 plus a few more we just had in the last few weeks that have been scanned, digitally available. But the number of African Americans in that 14,485 is about 50, maybe. So not a lot. Um, when I was working before taking this job, I got a chance to do a, a, a lobby display project over at the Brookstown Inn about the Freeze family, a very complicated story to tell about the use of that building built to be a cotton factory for the Moravian Church taken over by the Freeze family, run as part of the cotton and, and woolen mill enterprise that he had, and there's several other iterations of things becoming heiress to mill and then Brookstown Inn. But, it, but the mill across the street run by the Freeze family was a large user of enslaved labor, the second largest in the state. How to tell that in a lobby that says, hey, welcome to here. But you want to be honest about history, and we somehow muddled through it. But I had the decision to make the, the, the only good picture I could find of somebody who was an enslaved person was Wesley Washington Freeze, and I asked the woman working at the uh, desk in the lobby there at Brookstown, I says, how would you feel about it if I put as a representative of slavery in the Moravians a fellow in a three-piece suit? She says, that's not really right, is it? And I said, no, it's not, but that's the only picture I've got of somebody who was, a, that I know was a slave, but he was born in 45, and got his emancipation in 65. He worked at that Freeze Mill. But that's the picture you see at Old Salem Visitor Center. You've got Francis Freeze and that picture, and you know when you walk in there, that's just, that's something, but that's not the story. How do we tell that story? You go to the database on the Old Salem website, and that's a database largely of the European Moravians. There's a few scattered in there of the enslaved community, basically from that set of memoirs. 50 or so, the little cards. And that database really isn't done in a way that allows you to search the database. It's simply you gotta know a name and can you find something about that name. It doesn't allow you to, to inquire, inquire about the data. Opportunities. Uh, the opportunities that I'm gonna vision with you today and get hopefully some feedback from you wouldn't be uh, possible without the help of some dedicated volunteers around here. Our Family History Docent Program, which started last um, uh, spring. Barry Miller, uh, Johnny Pearson, Mary Audrey Apple, uh, and Sharon Michael just started up uh, with us, is, is going to be helping out too. But th these three folks, and old Mary Audrey especially, have really been putting a lot of time into figuring out how to get access to our data. That we know we've got a lot of, but, but it's not in a form that people can, can look at. I wanted to show you briefly today how our records have been used to tell that African American history in spite of this trouble of getting at individual data, and what prompted us to do the creation of some new research tools, how we're finding individual stories in the records of the Moravians, how we're using the church book of St. Philip's Church as the start of a community database, and how we hope to create easier access to individuals' data 
spotting of patterns and links to other data. It, probably the most prolific area of publications about the Moravian experience the last 20 years has been related to the African American experience. You all know these books. Uh, John Sensbach uh, was an early interpreter for African American uh, studies at Old Salem. He's written a couple books. When I was doing the freeze uh, work, Michael Shirley's book talking about that, tr that trauma between leaving the craft tradition behind and becoming a factory economy and overlaying in freeze vision enslaved labor, the tensions that caused in the community. Uh, Ferguson's work. We've got a, a Daniel Cruz is a, an important, we, we're, south, we're currently out of print of this uh, version of the, this, the records of the Moravian Church in regarding slavery, which is a popular thing. Old Salem is uh, in the last 20 years, uh, you know, it took sort of a, the, the St. Philip story was what kind of got it out of uh, a snapshot of a time period, a colonial time period, and allowed it to look at the community beyond the set time and just talk about this place over time. Uh, and you see it in the interpretation of the long church and then the second uh, building uh, that continues with all sorts of programming today. The research that was done on uncovering the, the graveyards that were there, in part to the records that were here of who was buried, but also you discovered how many that were buried there that had no record. Um, uh, we just recently went through another series of trying to identify with Salem Congregation uh, unmarked graves at the Second African Cemetery. I had a fellow call me wanting to know about uh, Charles Gibson, who was a, a man, personal manservant to Benjamin Forsyth and got killed in the War of 1812. And Gibson brought Forsyth's bat body back from near Canada to here for burial. Mm -hmm. He applied for uh, a, a soldier's pension, didn't get it because he was an enslaved person. When he died in the 1870s, there's a wonderful obituary about his life of service in the community. And we were able to locate his grave, and, and it was one of those that uh, was unmarked in Salem Congregation. They're going to have a talk next month from some folks in Salem Congregation about the work they're doing and, and how that's progressing on discovering the, the enslaved persons buried there. Mel White, who was the first. Uh, to, to tackle kind of the genealogy, the individual stories, and he's he sits now doing that private practice, and he says, you know, the part of the frustration is, um, in order to understand that the genealogy, the individual life stories, you realize that before this, at the times before say '65, you've got to realize that you're looking at people who were treated as property, and it's a very numbing thing to do over and over again to see the dehumanization process and. And frankly, all of our researchers get fatigued doing it. We've got about an hour, hour and a half that we can research on some of these records before we just get kind of tired of the stories. It's, it's, it's hurting. So um, that's, that's part of the problem. And you know that our big challenge is that our data about the African American community, a lot of it lies in unpublished diaries, under indexed publications, and church registers, which we just don't have digitally scanned and available for everybody yet. So how to get at it? Well, thanks to Hidden Town. You know, Hidden Town's asking a bunch of questions that are, that are uh, needed to be asked. Um, you know, they've been doing presentations around town. They had a wonderful service there at St. Phillips uh, back uh, in, the, in the fall. Uh, they're looking to identify on the ground the locations where uh, African Americans enslaved persons were located in the Salem village, I and mean, more generally, Wachovia, as part of that discussion. Um, we were uh, tasked to, to come up to see if we could help find answers to their two basic questions. How many enslaved persons were there in Salem, and where did they live? And my first response back to, to Martha said, well, we probably don't have anything more about where they live than you've got, because it's the records of the Officer Collegium, and if they were going to build something, they had to get permission to build a house, a new structure, and there are just not that many records of that. Uh, but the other thing is, uh, how many people, how many persons were enslaved in this area, and how many of those enslaved persons were part of the Moravian community? So we got ready for this visit from the uh, folks at Middle Tennessee State who were doing this Hidden Town 3D project, showed them some of our data, and looking at some of the sources that they were having before, I was trying to think, what do we have here that we can add to it? We went downstairs and we found this box with a file that says, uh, uh, record of enslaved persons, 
living in Salem, compiled late 60s, early 70s. It was a handwritten list of about 100 legal pages with no attribution on it. I thought, that's a really strange thing to find in my archive. And we were trying to recreate it. Richard and I were thinking maybe it's a list that, that somebody like Peter Africa would have put together. He was a professor of history at Salem College who wrote about the slave experience at about that time period. We've got some publications of his. And what is a series of lists uh, with dates and names? Uh, here, lists of people who were uh, uh, ownership not certain, those who are, and simply listed names. And in chronological order, there's one list with all these different names and dates. There's a second grouping of data that he put the names of individual slaves and what seemed to be references to the records of Moravians that were published. Okay? And there's this third list where he's listed them by household. And it could also be a sheep. It could be one of our archivists that did this. I don't, I don't know. What, what, who, we just don't know. But it's a very timely discovery. <laughs> All right, how can we plug in? And I know that Old Salem has its own databases. And part of what I hope comes out of our collaborative work is that we learn more what, we, what we've got and how to better share each other's information. But I know we didn't have the kind of record with this kind of detail. Here's a listing of, and it says up here uh, that the person wrote, was this person a member of the church? And how many slaves did they have? Simply counting numbers. And in this person, we, we figured out this person was interested in just getting, like an accountant, a total number. So this person, in weeding through, who, and we still couldn't exactly figure out what came from, there was some reference to it, I'll show you in a second, but he said there's 388 enslaved persons owned by Moravians throughout the time period of his source material, which, as it turned out, was uh, the church book, which is the register, uh, version of the register of St. Philip Church from the early days of 1822 to just after the Civil War, um, but his index, his listing, did not jive with the listing that we had from the back of that book, which basically just lists those who are the uh, actors, the principals, those who were baptized, married, or buried. He's got a lot of other names, and we took some time, our group of docents, uh, Barry and Johnny Pearson and... Uh, Mary Audrey, and we had Ashley Hauser, another uh, intern helping us, trying to figure out how to make sense of this. We checked it against our list of folks in the graveyard. We checked it against the list, uh, and, and you see, not a lot turned up there. There was new names. Um, we we cross-checked his list of who was a member, and we found that some of his data was not right. Some folks, he said, were not members were, some who weren't, you know. So that made me suspect when I was sharing this initially with Martha, I've got some data here, but we need to check this data before we say this is the data. So what we've been doing for the last mm, seven months is checking data. Um, and the sources are this church book of the people of color in about Salem, um, and then a smaller catalog of colored persons living in Salem, which picks up probably about 18, late 1850s, 1860s, only has about 80 names uh, in that. Um, now, what's interesting, when you looked at his totals, it made it realize that this was a, a valuable thing to pursue as a start of a searchable, ask questions of database, is he compared it to the only other sources that we had of snapshots of the enslaved community, which is the census of 1850 and 1860. Let's look, uh, look at a couple of examples that are interesting. Uh, here you see, well, let's see. In 1850... One male, one female for Joshua Boner. In 1860, one male, one female, and yet there are six slaves associated to that name over the course of this period. So clearly there's some others who were missing. Interesting too, uh, Francis Fries, 18 and 5, 23 slaves in the 1850 census, 48 in the 1860, and only 27 are in the church register. Yeah, maybe some, so, so, the, so it's a source that may say some things about a lot of things. I don't know yet. I'm learning. But it's worth checking it out. An easy, an easy way to approach this material, we thought, was, well, let's take the uh, stories that he has listed that are in the published records of the Moravians and see if what his list is checks out. And Johnny and Mary Audrey mainly 
went through that list, and it's pretty good. The frustrating thing is, is that if you look, for example, like under slaves, there's three entries here in this first um, index to the records of the Moravians. The records of the Moravian index is, is designed to tell a European Moravian story, not to tell the African American or enslaved story. So the index isn't necessarily going to be great help to you. Can we make that index better? And that's what our goal was in trying to get this information out. And so they have taken through the first seven volumes of material that our mysterious compiler had, put it into a form that you can read it and go search, and they've listed it as he did by the individuals named in the story. So here we have, and of course, it's Johannes Samuel or Sam at different times, depending on when it's in. It's the first baptized uh, African American right after the Gemaya. Uh, the Mike my house was opened here in Salem in 1771. They came back that afternoon for his baptism. Um, so you've got these stories that are now got, gathered together by volume number, where it was uh, in the community, and, and what time it was. Um, there's a number of unnamed persons there, and after looking at these stories, uh, our folks looking at it says, well, we probably can figure out who these unnamed persons were based on other information. Because once we know somebody's at the tavern at a certain place, we can kind of figure out who's at the tavern at a certain place, and so that person gets a name. We're suggesting that we're not putting it in stone, but these kind of things might help as you're looking at stories. Uh, you could also tell from looking at this gathering, or kind of get together a source of, you can get a sense of where the folks who were initially were in part of the enslaved community here came from. Three sources, the uh, town port community, um, the folks who were traders, in, in slaves, either in uh, through Charleston, South Carolina, or up in the Henry County, what's now Henry County, Pennsylvania County of Virginia, and from other Moravians and strangers living near Salem, that they would either now this, these would either be uh, outright sales, chattel slavery, or uh, loaning persons for a period of time for indebtedness, different ways that they came into Salem. But it's interesting that you can already tell patterns just from gathering these stories together. And then you gather these stories together, you can also track the spots where we know that enslaved labor was uh, used the most in the early days at the businesses like the tavern, the pottery, and other spots of commerce. So we can track that down. Now they've only done the first seven volumes. We've got a few more to go. They're tired, they took a Christmas break. We'll come back with you some more on that. Um, it may not have all the stories. I had lunch the other week with, uh, with uh, Barry and Charlie Roden. Uh, well, out of, uh, I guess he's helped with a, a community museum in Rockingham. He lives in Greensboro, but he's in Rockingham County and working on what's called the Sartown Project. And he discovered a reference in, this, in the 1775 time period, the records of the Ravens, about a visit from the fellow who runs the plantation up there to Salem to talk to the missionary, Peter Braun, who, used, who he knew growing up in Antigua. And, Farley, who was the fellow who owned this plantation in 1775, uh, is, is bought land up there by his father to, and has given 100 enslaved persons from Antigua to help start a plantation there, a goodly number of which were Moravian baptized in Antigua. And Charlie's research and looking at that says, ah, this was a lost opportunity that the Moravians could have had an outpost up there mission, doing mission work to that community. As it turned out, the uh, Plantation dissolved within a couple of years. But it's an interesting story to follow up. So it tells you that not all of the records, not all the stories about enslaved persons can be tracked the way we're doing it by the compilers, but there are other stories there too. Uh, part of the problem in following African American genealogy, especially from the uh, enslaved owner's perspective, <coughs> is um, keeping track of names and standardization of who is who. Uh, here's some issues. Uh, uh, the, of course, you had an old one about how the record of itself put together. The terms at the time uh, in, the, in the records of Arabians, they use a direct translation Negro in the first six volumes, and it changes a little bit later. Um, the enslaved free African Americans who were baptized and become communicants go through a, a process by which they get new names. So somebody's one name before they're baptized, and maybe another name or two afterwards. And if you're not familiar with that, you're coming in just doing family history, that goes, what? And that's one of the issues. Uh, spelling of names, Sherry, oh my goodness. You know, I always think it's entertaining how uh, the German word, Rutze, 
become rights, because that's just kind of a southern thing to do, right? It's rights as opposed to it. But there's so many variations in names and nicknames that are given to people that uh, you just have to, it would be nice if we had some way to flag that for folks who are doing research. I'm going to try doing that. Nicknames are commonly used. They change over time. Some names are especially popular. I don't think it's quite as bad in the African community as in the Europeans where John and Mary's and Johann and Marie, oh, you know. But, but there's a lot of familiar names. Names were passed from generation to generation. Mel White gave us a clue that he thinks that perhaps some of the names that were classical, uh, like Hercules or Virgil Jupiter, referred to enslaved persons born in Africa. First generations coming over. Um, so, um, it, and, and here's the, the key point to understand the lives of enslaved and free persons of color associated with Ruby and Wachovia, it's essential to understand the lives of the enslavers. So, how do you carry that information along when we know that ownership changes over time and tracking it? Well, it's a challenge. The church book helps. And one of the things we figured out is the reason he was able to populate, we had, I think, 311 names through the St. Philip's Register and our official index of people married, buried, or baptized. He comes up with 388. We started listing every name that he had because um, our goal is to share genealogy information. Uh, that's our niche. You know, Old Salem's goal is to interpret um, uh, buildings to tell the story through the buildings. Its role is a, has a, its heritage to, to, to celebrate and remember aspects of our history, and we want to have the details there for those who are interested in more depth and maybe in different stories. And so, um, simply putting the data out there in a form that people can then tell their own stories from it is an important thing for us. And uh, I think this is, church book is a good start because you at each Baptism here, 1821, you have one, two, three, four, five sponsors, and a mama and a daddy, so that baptism generates eight individuals with data. The data is who they're, they're, they're uh, the slaver, or where they were, and sometimes it tells you where they were, most of the times it doesn't, uh, but also there we've got information on the baptism of adults with somewhat less detail. Uh, the marriages are short and sweet, usually somebody to somebody else and who performed it. Deaths and burials, confirmation, they're in that book. As a result, we're creating this genealogy database. He listed 388 names. To date, we have 744 names when you put everybody in there. Everybody listed in that church book. And what we're, and this is, um, we have gone through checking his data and adding the details that, that he, for accounting sake, left out. We wanted to put in every detail that the text told us about this person, this event. To disgorge as much data as possible so that whoever's doing the research can find whatever story they wish to tell. But we need to have a way that you can search that data. So his, he had listed here, we listed his ownership of... Uh, where this person was assigned, which that way may, that may change if we go back and double check things. Um, and we, we have the, the date of the person's uh, birth, baptism, who was their baptizer, um, uh, then descriptions about them. Uh, I'll show you an example of the kind of depth of data that we're putting in here. Uh, Garrett Toombs uh, from uh, was White Forest and working with Hidden Town was interested in an enslaved person uh, named Julia who was at John Holland's place. It's one of the places that Hidden Town is studying as a potter. He was specifically requested that Holland was to remove his slaves from town. So since they're looking for places from where and to is an interesting thing. What can you tell us about Julia? As it turns out, our database can tell you a lot about Julia's story uh, just by connections. Um, you know, John Sensbach makes a lot in his book about um, um, in the church register, individuals who are sponsoring a lot of people have a, have a major role in the church. Well, after looking at all these things, I can tell you a lot of people sponsor a lot of people. Okay? It's not just one or two. It's a small community, but it, 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 it's a lot of people sponsoring. Now, here's Julia. Now, Julia's uh, 
married into the family, or, or from the, here we go, got sponsor of the first child in 1824, mother of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven kids, four sponsorships. Um, she's the property of John Holland. Her husband is John Budney. This is the son of Budney and Phoebe, the couple who's, in whose home in the, uh, uh, the quarter that the church started before it moved up to the building in 24. So this is an important family in the story of the community in, in Salem. And we've got all this listing. And, and uh, the husband, though, is property of Horatio Hamilton up till about 1840 when Hamilton dies. And then John Holland buys John Budney, and they're both owned by Holland, okay, as of IV 112. Um, here, uh, the first child she had was by Daniel Budney, property of David Bloom, and the others, as uh, we've got to mention here, are our notes, the following person. Um, and in, in looking at trying to find where they might have moved to, but when we did find reference to Holland buying a piece of property at the outside of, here's the Salem from the Vogler map, 63, and uh, this is a zoom in map with no date. But it's probably 1840, late 1840s or something, because we, we do have a map of, that shows the conveyance of this property here owned by Holland. He bought it from Rothus uh, in the 20s, about the time he was asked to, to, to put his slaves someplace else. And because Schober owned property here where, it, where his slaves were kept, we figured that the enslaved persons that were living with Holland. Uh, might have well moved out to that piece of property. Whether the uh, population of these parcels on the outskirts where the farming and, and other materials uh, that are not you know, central to the city life or the village life, um, whether that's the spot where enslaved persons lived in more generally, I don't know. Uh, but, but that was an interesting connection that we could take from the data there and look at our, we had a deed of that uh, sale of that property. And there you see the zoom in on the Holland thief. Uh, the records are not always accurate. Shock of shock. I know. Um, Francis Hagen, isn't he the Morning Star fella? Francis, bless his heart, beautiful song. Francis is a terrible secretary. <laughs> Francis on the same page can take the same name and spell it three different ways. It's the same name, Francis. Um, some of our Missionaries keeping the records. Uh, Abraham Steiner started out very detailed. Um, others not so much. But here we have the 1857 uh, Moya Lowe, who works on working with the Hidden Town Project. She's here today. She comes in and says, I've got a picture of a tombstone in front of Old St. Phillips, saying when Betty Toon was buried, it was in November of 57. And I've got on this card, it says October. Mm -hmm. and, and we come up here, and lo and behold, in the church book, it says October 5th. But now look at the detail, which is here or not here in this entry. Betty, the property of the raccoon, aged at blank. They just gave up the ghost in Millerite, and we're going to come back, never did come back, finish the detail. And, and, and so, how do we resolve this? We went to the church diary, and lo and behold, it records the date on which... Uh, this person was buried, and it was the date on the tombstone. So there are ways to check if this data doesn't work out right. Um, this is the hope when we finish checking all this information, and we have gone, we have entered everything that our original compiler in those um, 744 names, we, and probably of those we've added 50 that he missed. We talked about he was not always accurate in members. He didn't catch every name in the register. And we're only halfway through um, the number of baptisms. We've probably got another uh, 100 of those to do at four per hour. Uh, that's 25 more hours worth of data checking and entering to do. And I would bet we'll add 20 or 30 more names in that time period. Uh, persons, not all connected to the Moravian community, but all connected to St. Philip's Church and therefore plugged in. We have data on them. A uh, person not here able to date, Jennifer Holton comes in every Wednesday morning before going to her job at 9 o'clock and works from 7.30 to 9 o'clock on Wednesday morning, and all she does for me is enter data. Thank you, Jennifer. 
Just this week, <coughs> we had our first second generation. Louise, the property of David Bloom, was baptized in 24 in St. Philip's. And here we have in 45, she's coming back as a sponsor. She's our first second generation within the church person coming back and, and staying connected enough to, to do that role. Um, the extra information that our compiler added, I, you know, I'm new to this job. Uh, so when he, he says Eva Heggie, and we, the, the record doesn't say Eva, the record says Widow Heggie, I gotta go back and make sure that's who that is. Um, the data we already talked about with, with Moya's uh, circumstance, it, it degrades over time. Look at the detail in the death listings that Steiner puts in in the 20s. By the 50s, it's much shorter. By the 1870s, well, you know, a lot of these, non member, just cursory, which is one of the reasons we have the problem identifying. I think they found 300 persons buried in the, the new St. Philip's graveyard when we only have records for about 200. Uh, the record keeping was different. There are other sources, for those who are looking to do genealogy, there are other sources of data rather than our official church registers and our church record books. More, and, and we have this, um, sometimes our memoirs for our European descended Moravians are only in the um, diary. But we have some register information for the African community that are only in the diaries, especially at Bethania, which had a, a large number of enslaved persons. But there's some in the African church diary that the only references are, are to there. Uh, some of that's 80 persons or so in that uh, uh, catalog of persons of color. And uh, Bethania, uh, starting in 1805, some baptisms that are only there. Uh, we put some of them in the volumes 12 and 13 of the records of the Moravians. But if you're going to make this database complete, you want to integrate the information that we have there from church minute meetings and diaries. Um, we have a, a grant that we're working on trying to get help in digitizing and getting a hold of our photo collection. I love this photo. I've got two boys. That's why I love this photo. But here's an, here's an African-American person in the background. Judging from the hat wear, that's probably 1860-ish. High hats. Abe Lincoln wasn't alone in those days. So, um, who was that person? Who was his family? I don't have a record written on it, but wouldn't it be nice if we found some of that? Something other than that later. That picture of Wesley Washington Freeze is of him probably in his 60s and 70s, 40 or 50 years after he was an enslaved person. Now, our friends in the North in the last two months at the Moravian Archives in Bethlehem have just changed their website so that 45 of their 300 church registers, you can go on and digitally search the names. You can't do that at Old Salem's website for the African American community. You can't do it here yet. But I would love to have at least a searchable database of the names that we have uncovered so that people could get access to that. We will not have for the African community, the African American community, uh, the wealth of knowledge of the memoirs. The stories are going to have to be taken out of those records, written for other purposes. They're going to have to be called from patterns in the data. Uh, we're going to see the relationships coming from the data rather than in the form of a story. So the more we can get that data up and full, the better we're going to be. It's clearly a long-term project. I think Mary Audrey says, I, I, I won't let me see the end of this one. But um, you've got to start somewhere. Bulls rush in where wise men do. Yeah. Uh, I do hope that this collaborative we've got, uh, we just start started. We're going to meet again on Monday. We're trying to get together folks who are doing research in Moravian studies at an academic level, locally, who have an interest in the materials, connected with those of us like in Old Salem, here, Mesta, who have materials. Those who have materials have got to figure out better ways to tell others what we've got so that people can come use it. But also, just to network on that, these folks might be able to help us give us ideas on how to make these databases, this, this raw data, better accessible and useful to their publics. Um, and, and, and we're going to be meeting next month when the African American Genealogy Group comes to town on February 2nd. I, I had a chance to speak in Philadelphia to the African American Genealogy Group there. Had a great reception. I used to live in Philly. I know a lot of folks after the Civil War, their families went north to get a job. As a, Every third person there has got a relative in North Carolina, and a lot of them had an interest in our database. And I said, well, Upper Piedmont, come take a look, and, and we might have somebody to help you out. 
But we've got that there. Now, we've got a lot going on. I'll show you this crazy picture. That's my mama. She worked third shift. She had three kids. Clearly, she was half asleep at that period. I may look half asleep for the next two weeks, but I'll tell you, like my mama, it's a good time here at the archive. We've got a lot of interesting stuff going on, a lot of connections going on, and I appreciate your support, listening in, and I'm open to any suggestions you have at making our work go a little bit easier. It's just Nicole and Island staff. We didn't do it without our volunteers. I want to give a hand of applause to our volunteers. Can you help me out? Thank you for helping me. We're going to take the volunteers to lunch next week. I thank you the rest of you, but my budget's limited. But we want to celebrate our volunteers for getting us there.